Hello everyone and welcome back to the second and final session of this two-part webinar which is proudly brought to you by Austroads. My name is Angela Ratz and I once again have the privilege and pleasure of hosting you today. So my details will pop up on the slide in just a short moment. There I am. If you do experience any technical issues, please feel free to contact me as we go. Now I'm sure everyone's across the housekeeping items from last week and so I won't spend time on that. Uh, however, I will uh, point out at this time that we love interaction from our listeners. And so your questions are welcome at any stage of the presentation via the questions box. Without further ado, it's with great pleasure that I welcome our speaker, Peter Orman, back to the studio and to the microphone. Welcome, Peter. How are you on this beautiful, sunny Melbourne afternoon? Uh, hello, Angela, and hello to everyone listening. And I'm, I'm looking forward to this session. I think last session generated a lot of questions, a lot of interests, including some follow-up, and I'll get on to that shortly. Beautiful. All right. Well, um, then without further ado, we might uh, make a start, and if you wouldn't mind giving us a quick recap on what we covered last week, and uh, then, of course, what we're covering uh, today. Thanks, Angela. Before I get into last session, I, well, I thought it's worth just reiterating where we can get the Guide to Road Design Part 3 and in fact all the Austroads publications are located at this web address. And don't forget to get them if you're a road agency or a council, obtain a login from Austroads and you can download them for free. So just recapping, our, our webinar was comprised of two sessions. Session one, being last week, covered design objectives, speeds and cross-section. And today, session two, we're going to cover horizontal and vertical alignment and super elevation. Now, the purpose of the guide is to go through the changes that have been made in this update. So that's what the focus of the webinar has been about. In session one, a couple of issues arose and questions from the audience that I, I thought would be worth just reviewing and revisiting to provide some information. The questions were around local roads and unsealed roads. And I mentioned last week about a report by Laurie Comerford and I put it on the screen the title of the, the document, and there is a similar document that's just titled Subdivision Design Criteria, but the report produced by ARB, and this is back in 1986, is titled ARB Special Report Number 33, A Review of Subdivision Design Criteria. So that provides a bit of information on some local road design. Now just keep in mind, it was published in 1986, 30 years ago. So some things have changed. <laughs> That's my year of birth, actually. And the second one, which is uh, referenced actually in the Guide to Road Design Part 3, was about unsealed roads. And the, the guide or the practice manual referenced in the, in the Part 3 is the Unsealed Roads Manual, Guidelines to Good Practice. That was published in 2009 and led by George Giamara. That Now the availability of these, the first one, a review of subdivision design criteria, is actually not in print, print anymore, as you can understand, 30 years old and a lot of things have moved on. And the Unsealed Roads Manual is actually an ARB publication which is available via the ARB website. So just moving on to today, what we're going to cover is site distance, horizontal and vertical alignment, and auxiliary lines. So first of all, site distance. There hasn't been a massive change in site distance, but one key issue, and it actually deals with unsealed roads as it turns out, is in looking at the calculation of the stopping site distances, this longitudinal friction factor. And there's a new table, it's table 
it covers the longitudinal friction factor and we sometimes translate that with a longitudinal deceleration back factor to put in the equations within the guide. And you can see for a variety of speeds, this value here is towards the lower end of some of the values that are used in the broader tables. Now, of course, this is due to the fact that it's unsealed roads. And it's been found that the friction factor on unsealed roads may vary from as, be as low as 0.05 and as high as generally about 0.4. But the guide has adopted a sort of a mid-range type of approach as a practical way of applying a reasonable deceleration coefficient and that's why these values ranging from 0.27 down to 0.24 have been adopted. And this, this table by, by way of comparison is actually also contained in the unsealed roads manual that I mentioned earlier. There's a subtle change in table 5.5 .5 and you should, if you look at the heading which I've included here, this heading is table stopping site distance for cars on sealed roads. This heading is just taken from the 2010 edition but one change is the colouring of this D, the coefficient of deceleration value. This, is, this now in the guide suggests you need to obtain approval from the road agency if you want to adopt this value. So that's a key change from the previous edition. And, th and the reason for that change is that if you adopt that value, you can incorporate some relatively higher costs or have environmental impacts that the road agencies want to have some say in before we proceed with our design. There's an addition on calculating or the method of assessing site distance at various points. So the guide's included in some flow charts and these are first referenced in section five. But a new appendix, appendix G, has been incorporated in the guide. And so we have two flow charts and this one here, and I'll show you the, the second one shortly for cars stopping site distance where we have around roadside barriers and horizontal curves. So if you just step through the flow chart, and the flow chart extends greatly beyond what I've shown here, that will assist designers to assess the site distance around horizontal curve where you have barriers or obstructions. So this one, G1's for cars, and there's a similar one for trucks. There's some additional guidance on site distance in other circumstances, particularly where horizontal and vertical curves are So you pick two, two points on the road to check and applying your object heights and eye heights to check the distance between them. Is it visible? And if it's not, then you need to return to your design and improve that, that stopping site distance. So it's a reinforcement of the need to check these, particularly where there's horizontal and vertical curves. Some other commentary that's written to reinforce for the designer is what's called this hidden dip concept. 
can see this diagram here shows driver looking forward where there's a crest to a sag curve and this vehicle get, is hidden within that sag curve and so why that it's important to, to try and avoid these situations is that if a vehicle was overtaking they might think the road's clear so it's important that vehicles in the opposing direction can be seen at, on these distances. And that was one of the key messages from the last session too, wasn't it Peter? Basically, um, no surprises when it comes to your design. <laughs> I think, I think you, that's right Angela, and that's a, it's a good point about uh, driver behaviour that we don't want drivers making, um, I'll, I'll use the word knee jerk or, or reactionary type sure. decisions that, that might, uh, might cause them to take a travel path that they really didn't want to take. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's reinforcement of the need to check check these and there's some suggestions in there about how that might be overcome. So what we're trying to do is remove what we call these hidden dips. So you can see a couple of different circumstances here. We take out a sag curve and then we have an, a crest and a sag curve and how that would logically come out. The next area is in section 6.4 which is drainage considerations and drainage seems to come up a lot in every guide and drainage is a key element of making sure our road pavement surface is clear but also our, we're keeping the water away from our um, pavement material to pre preserve its structural integrity. So where some of the considerations we need to reinforce in the current guide have been introduced as particularly around flat areas and how we might deal with that. And we spoke a, a little bit about introducing some and moving crowns from centre to a lane line offset from the centre line last week. So here it's suggesting that we could introduce some parallel crowns or we incorporate some physical drainage type infrastructure by using a, a grading trench to cut off the water flow lines. Now clearly if you're going to install a grading trench you need to be mindful of travel paths, wheel paths because you don't want to introduce a hazard along a travel path so you need to be careful in locating a grading trench that you're not going to create a greater hazard. That's referenced in also in section 7.7.13 and I've just included these additional references as we go through the guide. So if you revisit these slides, you recognise not just 6.4, but there's other sections that, that are also covering this same issue. Most certainly, and good point. And I think we're just about up to a question break. Uh, so I'll leave that open for a moment for our audience to type through any uh, site distance related questions, anything that we've covered so far that may need further clarification. Uh, if in fact you're travelling well and uh, no questions at this stage, uh, if you wouldn't mind raising your hand, there's a little hand icon just to let us know you're, you're travelling okay and uh, following and up to speed. So I'll leave that open for a moment. We've got a few hands up, not everybody. Maybe they're typing their questions through. We'll give them another, another moment. This is a very important message though, um, Peter, and, and one that I certainly took away from the last session about um, no surprises. And as simple a concept as it is, um, one that's very important when designing the roads. Yes. Uh, yes, so we've got a question here for from Tony, rather, thank you for engaging with us, Tony. And Tony's asking, would design um, posted speeds and travel times, etc., be other considerations for hidden dips? Well, well, certainly the first consideration is what stopping site distance you have available, what overtaking site distance you have available. So they're all related to design speeds and travel times. So how long does it you take to overtake. So 
So I guess the answer to that is is you, you're focusing around the site distance criteria, and as you tr move along the road towards the hidden dip, are you always exceed meeting or exceeding that site distance requirement? Great. Well, thank you, Tony, for that question. Uh, another question here from Stephen, and Stephen's asking, uh, will there be guidance on um, desal coefficient for trucks on unsealed roads? Yeah, that's that's another. Look, I'm I'm not aware of any of the the ones I've seen are for cars. Um, maybe that's something that um, we the um, uh, could be taken on board by Austros to develop additional information for, for these. Yeah, absolutely. Good point. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, a question here from Mark. Uh, any comment on site distance obstructions, for example, filtered visibility through fences? Uh, I note US guidance is clear about unobstructed visibility. Any thoughts, Peter? Yeah, look, the guide doesn't, doesn't really uh, cover filtered site distance. It also seeks a similar requirement to the US of having unobstructed. I, I think it's it's people's perception of what, what are they viewing, how are they seeing it clearly is part of the issue there. Great, all right. Well, I hope um, we've been able to clarify your points. Thank you, Tony, Stephen and Mark for engaging with us. All right, Peter, we might move on to the next part of the presentation then. The next section is on horizontal alignment. <coughs> Excuse me. There's some additional information on curves and changes of speed. So the guide talk provides this guidance of, and an information for designers about speed reduction. And if we have an excessive speed reduction and it's referenced at 30 kilometres per hour from an approach speed of 100 kilometres an hour, the risk of a runoff road casualty crash increases by 5.1. So it's something to be alert to and aware of about straights leading into curves. It was also found that a single curve with a radius of 600 metres or less had a, have the greatest risk compared to a uh, sharp curve with a 100 metre radius, which is 5.5 times higher. Now this is all referenced in a, in a research report produced by Austroads, and I've referenced it at the bottom of the slide. Reinforcing, and this is just to reinforce the application of straights, curves, changes of speeds, and the need to be mindful of increases in crash risk if we're not careful about how much we're causing the speed to change by. There's a, a section on curves and we, we talk about broken back curves and we really try to avoid them. And the reasons we try to avoid them include things like poor lane discipline by drivers and that they can be difficult to super elevate through the curves. And I've included a photo on the bottom right there just to show what we mean by a broken back curve. So on the left is a plan view and on the right is a photo of this curve to a short straight to another curve. So this is just additional information leading into the design of the road. Reverse curves also can be problematic. We prefer not to use them. You need, and if you do need to use them, make sure there's sufficient sight distance and you're able to develop super elevation when you require it. There are some exceptions to the preference of not using them. Clearly, if you have a constrained site, so you have limitations already placed on you, you may use them, or on high-speed approaches that are used to slow vehicles. Now, if you're aware of the guidance contained in the Guide to Road Design 
part 4B on roundabouts includes a section on reverse curve approaches to a roundabout to help reduce speeds. So there's an example of a high speed approach where you may want to slow vehicles. Now where we can't avoid rever um, reverse curves, then we need to provide these transitions and spirals up from the tangent or the straight approach into the curve. We're trying to provide a smooth and stable motion for the vehicle as they go from the straight into a curve and the, the spiral provides that transition. And we need to develop the super elevation around each curve. So we need normal super, ele super elevation development should be applied for each curve. There's some guidance on the lengths about these transitions. So the transition to spiral, and I've used added the TS in there because it commonly appears through the guide. And this minimum length should be equal to the design speed, which is V in metres. So if the design speed is 100 kilometres per hour, that length is 100 metres. And then there's suggested in the guide about a desirable minimum and an absolute minimum length of 0.7 by your design speed and 4.6. If we're designing for trucks, the reverse curb, we need suggested that this, this uh, transition should be at least 0.7 times your design speed to allow for the wheel tracking. Now this is a change from the 2010 edition which suggested 0.6 times your design speed as this transition length. So just be aware of that. There's a, there's a change in the to the 2016 edition. There's a series of different arrangements for reverse curves and there's there's a number of these and I'll, I'll quickly go through them now. So it's additional information on how you we deal with reverse curves for different types of situations or circumstances. In this, this one, the first one I've got here, we have our, and if I just, for the purposes of my trying to get the directions right, I'm travelling from left to right, so my entry curve is here, and my joining curve on the right is down here, and this requires a transition or a spiral into here, and a spiral at this end, but is joined by a straight or tangent length. So in this, this situation, it's called a short separating tangent and a short means it's about 0.6V in that, so V, remember V is your design speed, about how we might deal with that. So what we want to achieve here is develop the super elevation from one curve to the next applied over the full length of both curves and transitions. The next case is where there are no, plant, no transitions. So we have a tangent or a short section between two curves and it suggested, the, the guide suggests that the super elevation development is a little bit different and we should run it off into the circular curves. It needs to be run off clearly. You're going to need to do that to get the development length you need and the guide suggests what percentage of that runoff, that super elevation runoff, is located prior to the curve and hence into the curve. And that's a new table, 7.2. Or 
portion of super elevation runoff located prior to the circular curve. So there's just a bit further guidance on this minimum length for a short tangent. Should be less than the length of both curves, super elevation runoff lengths. Of course, less the amount that's extended into the circular curve for that development. The next case it considers is where there's a long separating tangent. That's shown here, where we come in, have our planned transition or spiral into a straighter a tangent than exiting that alignment. Now a long tangent has been described as greater than four seconds of travel. So that length is greater than four seconds of travel. For this arrangement, what we'll be trying to establish is that the in that straight section, this section here, so this diagram is the same as the one on the previous slide, we're returning the cross balls or the super, ele super elevation back to its normal crown cross section. One limitation on on this type of arrangement is it's only used on undivided two-way roads, not divided carriageway roads. The next arrangements where we have reverse curves without a separating tangent or a straight. So the entry comes in our entry curve, travelling through transitions to our exit curve. So here are our key points and our transition is between here and here. And what we're trying to create here is the super, super elevation runoff should extend into the circular curve. So that's through here in these zones. The minimum, I'll just go back, sorry. The minimum length of a short tangent should be the length of both curves, super elevation runoff lengths, less the amount extended into the curves. So, is there any questions? Yes, so we've got some questions. So, um, I will take this opportunity just to remind people that we are recording today's session. Uh, for those of you who missed that information at the beginning of the webinar, um, and all of that material will be shared with you uh, by the end of this week. So, keep an eye on your emails. A question's come through from Durga, and the question reads, what should be the maximum speed reduction or reduced speed for a curve for speed of 80 kilometres per hour. Is there any specific rule of thumb to apply the speed restriction? Yeah, the rule of thumb is in, in, in really trying to reduce this change of speed to about uh, 30 kilometres an hour or less. Um, I know there's some, there's some different guidance around, it could be 20 kilometres an hour, and, and certainly at 100 kilometres an hour, the guide, this guide, part three, suggesting 30 kilometres per hour. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What, what you're trying to avoid is it's the driver workload and driver recognition of the, the speed at which they need to travel around the following, following curve. Um, we certainly want to avoid them making, entering a curve at too fast a speed, so they haven't recognised that speed because we've maybe put a really tight curve on a fast curve, causing the speed reduction to be too great and they may well run off the road. Mm -hmm. So, look, um, 
it's a very coarse rule of thumb. <laughs> um, but I'd, I'd be in around that 20 kilometre per hour mark. Great, thank you for your question, Durga. That was a good one. I have a question also from Gavin, and Gavin's asking, uh, is the guy suggesting that super elevation is appropriate for even low speed roads? Well, I think what the guy's suggesting is super elevation is needed to, or no, come back to what? why do we super elevate? Uh, I think we've got to understand or think about why are we super elevating, and that's to keep, help drivers negotiate around the curve mm -hmm. and and keeping them on the travel lane that we want them to travel. So so as your speed drops you may well determine depending on the, the radius of course and there's guidance about super elevation curve radius in the guide mm -hmm. and you can use those formulas to determine whether you should super elevate or, or may well super elevate. One of, one of the challenges in local roads, and we spoke about local roads a lot last week, but I know when you super elevate some roads you may well get an increase in speed beyond what you are, are hoping for. So one always needs to consider the circumstances at which the road is located, the topography, the types of drivers, the surrounding environment that's contributing to driver behaviour. But in essence, come back to why, what am I trying to achieve with super elevation? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fair enough. All right, Gavin, thank you for your question. Um, we'll take two more questions uh, and then we'll move on to the next section or rather we'll, we'll continue with horizontal alignment. Uh, so the next question is from Barada and the question is, do we need spiral for speed less than 60 kilometres per hour? Um, look, I'm not. I'm not sure your your spirals is is really a, a link, a transition between a tangent and a and a circular curve. Um, your circular curve would have a design speed on it, and you're transitioning from a straight to that circular curve. So, whether 60 kilometres per hour is is an issue, or whether you're transitioning from one speed to another, but you could be just transitioning from a straight travel path to a circular travel path. Okay, Barad, I hope we've clarified that for you. And we'll take one more question. This one's from James. It refers to slide number 25. So if we could pop it back there and I'll read the question out. And so it says slide 25 mentioned uh, desirable minimum twice but with different lengths of straight road between reverse curves. Could you clarify, please? I'll get there. We'll get there. Bear with us, James. Okay, yes, this... This is, um, this sometimes happens in guides. <laughs> we, I think what James is referring to, this desirable minimum, mm -hmm. We're saying it should be equal to design speed, but the guide goes on to say the desirable minimum is 0.7b. I, I would, um, James, I would be um, going down as your minimum, desirable minimum 0.7 with an absolute minimum of 0.6. This, this comment here, oops, sorry. So, so, that's the way I, I'd interpret this guide. But it's something we, we need to, to uh, perhaps um, record in our amendment sheet for the next review of the guide to check the wording of some of these clauses to make sure that we're providing consistent information through the guide. And, and if, if any of you recognise some inconsistencies, there's a feedback process um, through Austroads that you should feed, feed your the issue you've identified and it can be either corrected through an errata issue or taken into account in the next review of the guide. 
Absolutely, Osroad very much uh, values and relies upon that feedback from all of the practitioners out there. So if something does come to mind, uh, you can let us know at the end of uh, this webinar or in fact by contacting Osroads Direct. So thank you very much for that uh, question, James, and also Durga and Gavin for uh, and Barada for engaging with us. So we'll move on and we'll take some more questions later in the presentation. Thank you. So we're still on horizontal alignment, but there's some additional guidance been added into the guide for super elevation design procedure. And it's a step-by-step -step process. So I've been just included them here to relate to some of the sections and figures that are included, but it steps through the design of the development of the super elevation, starting with selecting your radius and speeds selecting then using either figure 7, 7, 7, 8 or 7, 9 and I'll just go to the next slide and that figure I've included figure 7.7 .7. by way of example with 7.8 and 7.9 being similar types of lines and speeds and radiuses So a new, some additional information for designers on developing super elevation. The last couple of steps are again to check related to drainage, checking flat spots, and then also checking your maximum depth of water flows. And this is about trying to avoid aquaplaning potential. There's some initial guidance on, on um, what the term used, rounding, a rounding vertical curve on the, the outside edge of a pavement that's being super elevated. And this is about the appearance of the road. And what we're trying to do is make the road still appear nice, um, consistent lines, we don't have uh, jagged or what appear to be abrupt changes in direction. So I've just included a section to show how that might occur. We have the vertical curve and this, this line here, the outside edge, and then a rounding vertical curve is incorporated to smooth out those changes, so it's, it's an appearance type issue. And the guide suggests through some rounding curve links in the new table, 7.9 for that. And some of the lengths in mentioned in that table for a single line, the rounding vertical curve might be 20 metres as an, um, as an example of the length of vertical curve we're talking about. There's a new section, 7.7.12, on super elevation development on shoulders. So firstly, sealed shoulders. So when we're super elevating, the, sh the shoulder has the same cross fall as the, the adjoining pavement. Of course what all we're doing is rotating not just the pavement but the shoulder in developing the super elevation. On unsealed shoulders, sometimes we have a need for a higher cross fall and that's around for drainage purposes to try and assist keeping the water flowing off the pavement. And I've just shown a figure, this is a new figure in the guide to show how that super elevation might occur. 
So I've included the whole figure. So we talk about one points on the road, one to six, and translate down to the cross section. So these are cross sections as we travel along from points one to six. How we start with our crowned cross section. And we're rotating to a single cross wall and how that might appear in your cross sections. So that's just provided as an example of how the pavement and shoulder might be rotated to achieve that from a crowned profile to the single cross wall profile. There's a new section emphasising the need again for drainage issues and recognising that where you have flat spots they may occur particularly where that we have that level cross section and a, a longitudinal flat grade. So we need to be mindful of these locations and, and avoid them and we can avoid them by undertaking some geometric changes and the, the examples are longitudinal grade changes or super elevation changes or rotating the pavement about one edge a bit differently but what we're trying to do is remove a flat spot within our road pavement. And the guide, the guide goes on, and I've used, included the references to figures 714 to 721 to show how some of these things might occur. Um, Peter, sorry, before you move on with the vertical alignment, uh, we did have a question earlier from Peter. It refers to table uh, 7.2, which I believe is on slide 28, so <laughs> sorry to make you go back a wee while, but the question reads um, that within that table it's showing 20 to 0 kilometres per hour, and if that's correct. Mm -hmm. I'll just have, to, just have to excuse me until I get there. We'll get there in one moment. So that's the one there, so 20 to 0 in, in terms of the operating speed. Um, no, that is not actually correct. That should be 20. I'll just check that. I'm, I'm pretty sure that should be 20 to 80. So Trevor, um, thank you Trevor, he's chimed in with a comment saying guide says 20 to 70. <laughs> Go Trevor. Uh, yet yeah, and um, yes, my, Nandini also says it's 20 to 70 my, in the guide. <laughs> my, my apologies to everyone for uh, um, that was actually corrected in the final edition. When I was preparing the slides I had an early, early edition that we picked up this error. Oh no, that's not what happened. We're testing our listeners and thank you um, Peter, you passed that, was, that test. So. <laughs> yes, so, um, uh, apologies to everyone. I, I, that's all right. We'll make that correction, and we'll um, we'll make sure that the new set of notes sent out to everyone has that. Thanks for that. Um, and um, thank you for everyone else that commented and sent questions through. We'll move on with the vertical alignment segment of the presentation, but we will have time for questions later on. So we'll just ask for your patience until then. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Angela, and thanks for that pickup again. There's some ind additional information included in the guide about uh, vertical alignment, but more so about clearances. And you can, you can. I've just used this illustration here, this figure here, to illustrate the issues. And the design talks about providing clearance. For a 19 metre design semi-trailer or other appropriate design vehicle. Now what that leads to is if 
if you were designing this road for a larger vehicle, for example, which we, in some cases on arterial roads, we do, but for a larger vehicle, you would apply the larger vehicle, not necessarily the 19 metre design semi-trailer. So again, whilst the, the, the guide says, says that, there is a qualifier, so just be alert to that. There's some additional information on, again, on clearances and a table, new table 8.1, suggesting typical minimum. Remember, these are typical minimum vertical clearances over roadways and pedestrian cycle paths. I haven't included the whole table here, suggesting clearances for different circumstances. Now why they're important, of course, is when you're designing the road and overpass to my, for your grading of that overpass. And I've just used an example here of some of the locations that you may check on this figure. And this is out of figure 8.2. A, B and C are on the, the road under this overpass. And these are some of the points. So we're talking about there's the pavement here or traffic lanes here, traffic lanes here. So these points, you can see where the points are. We're checking points on the traffic line. And this, I think, in part assumes um, it could be a crown or a single cross wall, more likely a single cross wall, making sure we're picking these points, because and whilst in this example J and I, you might suggest they're on the same, but this, this road might also have a grade on it, so that's why we're checking both. So just some of the points that you would consider the checking for these vertical clearances. When we come to pedestrian bridges, the guide suggests that you add on 0.2 metres to those clearances and that's due to the four pedestrian bridges due to their provide some additional clearances. There's some additional information again on crash risks within the guide, just to inform designers about the grades and the crash risks. So what, what's been found is uphill grades, there's an increase of crash risk of 2.6 2 times. That seems, seems pretty high anecdotally, but compare that to downhill, where the increase in risk is 5.6 times. So steep grades, so we're talking about 6% or higher, there's an increased crash risk compared to a flat, a, a flat road. So, so just something to be aware of and that you might consider then your roadside environments. There's some additional information on the length of steep grades and this is more about asset management where the guide points to the fact where, it, where there's a sprayed seal surface and you, you're wanting to apply it on a long uphill grade then due to this risk, this heavy vehicle tractioning up the grade, it suggested that the maximum grade be about 4% with an absolute maximum of 5% and this is about this asset management issue of protecting the surface of your road. So again, 
the circumstances are a long uphill grade, high speed, so 100 kilometres an hour, and trying to achieve a maximum grade of 4%. If you can't exceed, if you need to go steeper than 4%, it might be worth talking to your pavement people in your organisation about suitable pavement materials. There's some additional information on crest vertical curves and providing overtaking opportunities. And it's just suggesting that where our site distance is less than the overtaking, where our available site distance is less than overtaking site distance, is we might increase the length of the vertical curve to enable us to provide overtaking zones each side of that vertical curve. Or if the, stop, the site distance is between the stopping site distance and overtaking site distance and we can't lengthen the vertical curve, there's the option to then consider as well, what if I decrease the length of the vertical curve and then establish these overtaking zones each side. Again, we're trying to avoid the overtaking zones on the vertical curve. In all of those cases, though, make sure you, you still have stopping site distance. This next section, section 8.6.7, it's a new table talking about minimum lengths of vertical curves. And the table suggests for a range of operating speeds and a grade change, a length of vertical curve, a minimum length of vertical curve. I've only included part of the table here, but you can see just looking at the table here, and I can only, only show here the, the lower speeds, but where we have a 40 kilometre an hour, once this 1% grade change, we don't need a vertical curve. But once we go above that, we start incorporating vertical curves. In part, that's for appearance, so the road looks nice and smooth as we look along it. And the guide also suggests that these be increased by 50%, so these distance, if the driver looks, has a straight to a vertical curve, you can see it for at least 500 metres, we should increase these. And this is related to an effect or perception by the driver and it's, it, the appearance of the vertical curve is what we're, why that's suggested to increase. It's, it's how it's being interpreted by the driver. For a reconstruction project, so this is where now in the brownfield site, so there may be some constraints. This table I mentioned before about the changing grade, so these are for reconstruction, so my apologies for that. Um, we can accept slightly shorter vertical curves. Now we have reached a question break, but I am conscious of the time and we've still got a section on auxiliary lanes to go. And so what we might do, and um, pardon us ladies and gents, but in the interests of covering all the material in the hour that we have, we might move on, do the next section and we'll see if we have time at the end to take some more questions. Thank you. Okay, there's just, uh, there's additionally just some sketches included on locating overtaking lanes we have an isolated, we have them separated. And one of the key issues about separating them is trying to avoid zones where the two mergers occur. And what's been suggested as desirable, this distance here, so we're merging here in my left to right and right to left we're merging here that generally this distance is three seconds of travel time. So that's what this X is. 
So we're separating the merge locations. And for, for overtaking lanes, there's a design procedure included now in the guide. It's an eight-step procedure and it covers things like, like location. And we spoke a little bit about location in the previous slides. The warrants for actually when do you provide an overtaking zone and then evaluating the effects. There's a new figure, figure 9.6, that deals with overtaking lane warrants based on other opportunities for passing, the traffic volume in the opposing direction, and this overtaking zone down here, and then a comment making we have either good overtaking, adequate or inadequate. There's some additional information also on, on plane tapers, diverging tapers firstly. So selecting the starting point. And how, how the overtaking lane is enhanced by developing the pavement widening on a horizontal curve because it provides a, a lead-in entry to the left side of the pavement, making sure it's visible. So, trying to where on a straight, it's visible. And the comment is also included about commencing the line just before a curve. So, this is not at the curve, but before the curve. It can of cause appearance problems, so that'll be an issue for the driver about interpreting the start of the overtaking or the, the taper. Now, this is a merging taper. Again, new additional information. Some of the things to consider. Again, the driver driver needs to be able to identify the termination of it of the lane. So visible. We need to have adequate sight distance, this merge sight distance to allow drivers to decide whether they're going to to continue into the uh, manoeuvre. And then finally we want to complete the merge so uh, before we get to any median island. That's clearly that if there's some disruption to the traffic we don't have an obstacle necessarily that's going to contribute to some uh, some crash. And here we are again at question time and I think that also marks the end of the presentation today with about a minute to spare. Thank you Peter, that was great. Uh, thank you to everyone who sent through questions and I apologise if we're not able to cover them all today. Um, we, we only have that uh, 60 minutes but you are most welcome to send Peter a question uh, on email and so his details will be up on the following slide. Now he has informed me that he's in fact going on holidays for a week so uh, if there's a slight delay in getting back to you please do be patient, he will get back to you. We'll take one more question before we finish up though um, and this one's come through from Rodney and so Rodney's asking, are the rounds really necessary for super elevation? It makes a two to three millimetre difference to the pavement. The construction company <laughs> have a 20 millimetre tolerance usually. Any thoughts on that Peter? He's having a giggle. <laughs> oh, I can understand the construction tolerances because sometimes overzealous designers make things very precise mm. and and don't take account of construction tolerances that can vary and I guess I'm not used to necessarily in that circumstance 20 mil millimetres but certainly 10 millimetres in some some locations. Look I, I, I think that's a that's a that's a very good consideration when you incorporate this rounding you may well be incorporating it without realising it but the, it's all about the appearance of the edge of the road, so so it's in in that circumstance that's been just descri described. 
it would be um, you probably wouldn't include it because um, you're not going to by including a vertical curve you're not changing anything if, if the change is only two or three millimeters but what I think would probably happen is when they're when they're setting their lines along that road the road construction crew would be would have rounded it to some some degree anyway Great. Well, thank you, Rodney, for engaging with us. And Peter, are there any final words or a final message that you'd like to leave our listeners with uh, in light of this being the second and final session of this uh, two-part series? Yes, the the, um, the amendments through the guide, this guide, in my I don't. There've been there've been a number of changes, and a lot of more in, additional information included in the guide. Um, it should help designers to appreciate a little more about the background of some of the issues in developing design criteria. But I think it's, it's like a lot of things the, that implementing it and applying it um, helps reinforce those ideas and may, may well generate some additional questions, which again use the same mechanisms we've discussed earlier in this webinar, if you, if you would like an answer. Um, I, I, one also hopes that there's colleagues in your in your um, engineering office that can also help you. But I think uh, the opportunity to go through Austroads is, is always there. I think there's another opportunity coming up in 2017 with some planned training courses on on the built around the Austroads guides on the road design. So keep an eye out for those. Absolutely. Uh, you'll receive correspondence from myself, that's Angela Ratz here at ARB. Uh, should that be the case, we'll be in contact with you right away. And as this webinar does close down, ladies and gentlemen, a survey will pop up on your screen as it did last week. And if you could kindly let us know how we travelled over these two sessions, we'd be extremely grateful. It will also be a good opportunity for you to let us know uh, if in fact you would like to attend further training in this topic area. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. So on that note, Peter, thank you so much for your time in preparing uh, this two-part webinar and um, it's lovely having you in the studio as always. And to our listeners for tuning in this week, thank you so much. We hope you can join us for future Austroads webinars. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>